Dude, what an amazing time we had this weekend. But just in case you didn't make it to one of our campuses um, and you hadn't had an opportunity to catch up online, I wanna get you caught up on what we talked about. We're in this series isolated and we're talking most specifically about Jesus and him dealing with temptation and what a great example he can be to us. Now in Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus answers Satan as he's being tempted. He says, is it, it is written, man cannot live by bread alone, but every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And what Jesus is talking about here is the reality that it's not about my appetites. In fact, I need to refocus my desires. And, and if I can do that, if I can refocus my, des my desires, they'll drive me to greatness. Now, Jesus understands this completely because he's kind of going head to head with the devil and he's been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. So clearly he's hungry. Now, here's the deal, right? It's okay to recognize your hunger pains. God isn't asking me to deny my legitimate needs. But instead, what God's asking me to do is to see what of those needs are really the most important. And he wants me to kind of share my needs, my desires, my wants with him and with others. When I communicate the appetites that are going on in my life, both good and bad, then it helps me to kind of become all that God's called me to be. Now, I also have to reject the quick fix. You know, like sometimes when I'm hungry, I'm not actually hungry. I'm longing for something more meaningful, but I try to fix it with something quick and easy. See, Jesus can identify with our desires for the immediate gratification and the feelings um, of entitlement, but we have to be careful of those feelings of entitlement. Here's the key, letting go of those cravings, right? The ones that control me, the ones that drive me, the desires, the temptations that push me past the place where they're healthy. And then I have to learn to satisfy my appetite with meals that have real sustenance. Now think about that. The Word of God. The Word of God has amazing sustenance. And so when we look to it for the answers, this is a powerful moment for each of us. All right, so you should be all up to speed on what's been going on. Now I want you to take some time and share an example of something that you crave or that you have craved. Now remember, cravings can be both good or bad. How do you put these cravings in check so that you control them and that they don't control you? Take the next few minutes and talk about that.
We begin today by looking at a cool story in the life of a man named Joseph. And during our time, we're going to see how Joseph's focus on representing and, and being obedient to God was totally rewarded. And this account can be, a found, be found, by the way, in Genesis chapter 39. So here's the story. Joseph, he'd been taken to Egypt by a group of people called the Ishmaelites. Potiphar, an Egyptian, one of Pharaoh's officials and, and the manager of his household, he bought Joseph from them. And as it turned out, God was with Joseph and things went very well for him. I mean, he ends up living in the home of his Egyptian master. And his master recognized that God was with him and saw that God was working for the good everything that he did. And he became super fond of Joseph and made him like his personal aide. And he put him in charge of all of his personal affairs, turning really everything over to him, which was amazing. And from that moment on, God blessed the home of this Egyptian, all because of Joseph. You see, the blessing of God spread over everything he owned at home and in the fields. And all that Potiphar had to concern himself with was eating three meals a day. <laughs> and now Joseph, he was a strikingly handsome man. And as time went on, his master's wife actually became super infatuated with Joseph and one day said, sleep with me. And he wouldn't do it. He said to his master's wife, look, with me here, my master doesn't give a second thought to anything that goes on here. He's put me in charge of everything he owns. He treats me as an equal. And the only thing he hasn't turned over to me is you. You're his wife after all. How could I possibly violate his trust and sin against God? But she pesters him day after day. But he stood his ground and he refused to go to bed with her. Now, on one of these days, he came to the house, like to do his work, and none of the household servants happened to be, them, be there. So it was super dangerous. And she grabbed him by his cloak saying, sleep with me. And he left his cloak there in her hand and runs out of the house. And when she realized that he had left his coat in her hand and ran outside, she called to her house servants, look, this Hebrew shows up and before you know it, he's trying to seduce us. He tried to make love to me, but I yelled as loud as I could. With all my yelling and screaming, he left his coat beside me here and ran outside. And she kept his coat right there until his master came home. And then she tells the same story. She said, this Hebrew slave, the one you brought to us, came after me and tried to use me for his plaything. And when I yelled and screamed, he left his coat with me and ran outside. So here's the question. After hearing this account of this story, what are some of the observations that stuck out to you and captured your attention? And take a moment to evaluate the motives and the position of those in this story.
Okay, so here's the next question. Is Joseph focused on representing God throughout this passage? And what are some examples of how he stays focused?
You know, there are several things that stand out to me when trying to better understand Joseph's reaction and this whole scene. I mean, the first part that I notice is that Joseph says that Potiphar does not give a second thought to what occurs at the house. So Joseph probably could have easily given in to the temptation and, and gotten away with it, at least for a while. But instead, Joseph tries to reason with her that because all this had been entrusted to him, there is no way that he could betray his master. There's no way. And second, Potiphar's wife makes her proposition to Joseph with a two-word imperative in the Hebrew. What this means is that her words are not invitation, but a command. And this frames her request as lacking true heart of feeling. And instead, we can safely assume that she's just totally driven by lust and loneliness and desire. So just imagine that Potiphar's wife is crass and really a slave to lust, while Joseph masterfully controls the temptation before him by bringing God and the power of his teaching and promises into the picture. And then third, when Potiphar's wife could not hold back her desire for Joseph anymore, Joseph fled from her and the sin that was trying to put him in bondage. He did not just walk away, but he ran away from the sin and left his cloak behind in order to do so. He had to know that there would be trouble. So through the text, we can assume that, that he knew who he was and understood that if he gave in to this sin, it would separate him from God. I mean, his relationship with Potiphar and the respect of others in his care, it would all be a train smash. And if Joseph pursued this course, he would have lost his true identity and his purpose. So the third question, is there anything in your past that has caused you to question your purpose and your identity? And how do you define who you are as a true Christ follower? So go ahead and discuss that.
Joseph's story goes on and God uses him mightily in the land of Egypt. But let's talk about what happens after this conflict. Genesis 39 ends by explaining what happens to Joseph. When his master heard his wife's story, telling him, these are the things that your slave did to me, he was furious. So Joseph's master takes him and throws him into the jail where all the king's prisoners were locked up. But there in jail, God was still with Joseph. He reached out to him in kindness and he put him on good terms with the head jailer. And so this head jailer puts Joseph in charge of all the prisoners. He ends up managing the entire operation. And the head jailer gave Joseph free reign. He never even checks on him because God was with him. He could see that. And whatever he did, God made sure it worked out for the best. So wait a second. So Joseph ends up in prison. I mean, did God save him with a legion of angels or give him justice through a court? No, God had bigger plans for Joseph. And he continued to praise God and lead others in prison. You see, sometimes we do the right thing and experience what we believe to be the wrong result. See, just because we live in an imperfect world, does that mean that God is imperfect? No, God is in the business of using normal men and women like you and I in impossible situations to bring a message of hope and salvation to a people who need redemption. So here's the question. What temptations are most attractive or have hindered you in the past? And how does God see these hang-ups and habits? Just as Joseph had an escape plan for temptation, what is yours? Go ahead and discuss that.
just, it was a little yeah. weird. Don't cut. Don't cut. No cutting. All right. And action. As we end our time together, I want to challenge each one of you to look into the life of Joseph by reading Genesis chapter 37 through 49. And my hope is that you'll continue growing closer to the God that Joseph served and that you would have faith that God is going to use you in extraordinary ways as we run to him. That's my prayer this week for your group. And I can't begin to tell you how much of a privilege it is for me and all the other campus pastors to see you as the church shaking up communities near and far for Jesus Christ. Thank you.